So in our last video, we talked about a lot of corrective exercises you can do if you're having trouble with getting in the right position squatting. Today we're going to talk more about what those positions should look like. And one thing I want to make real, real clear at the very beginning of this is we're not going to tell you, okay, when you go to squat, you put your hands here, you put your feet here, you push your hips back, you push your hips forward. Those type of things, my opinion, might you know, tell me if you agree or not, but there are so many variables that go into an individual's body. You just can't do that on the internet like this. You need to be working with a coach on a daily basis, somebody who knows the human body, who can watch you move, watch what positions you get into, to make those type of prescriptions. So, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it. Uh, if you see my squat, my squat looks a little bit weird sometimes. But, I don't have great leverages for squatting, right? I have a short torso, I have long legs, I'm very low back and quad dominant. All those things go into it, your individual leverages, your muscular strengths and weaknesses, you know, which is part genetic, part just what you've done in the past, and then what your goals are. If you're trying to be a bodybuilder, get big ass claws, you're not going to want to do the same thing as a powerlifter who's trying to move as much weight as possible. So, Absolutely. You know, um, I was just saying about a minute ago that one thing I've told my athletes for years is that if you are, if someone's selling you black and white things about the human body, you probably want to run the other way as fast as possible because there's so much gray area. Like for example, he's a quad dominant, lower back dominant lifter. I'm posterior chain and back dominant. My quads are my weakness on my squat. So how he squats compared to how I squat is going to differ somewhat greatly. I mean, even something like the rack position, your shoulder mobility, where you can get your hands. So, you know, to say that this is the best position, I mean, it depends on who you are. So you definitely got to, you know, have someone that knows how the human body works and, and, and knows how to make adjustments based on your specific leverages and your specific anatomical differences or, you know, injuries, you know, immobilities, etc. Now, I will say that if you have immobilities, you should be working on them so that you can get into those better positions, you know, so check out our previous video. Um, but, like, I, I had a buddy of mine, he's a strength coach, he's got, you know, master's in biomechanics, and he, uh, he jokingly said to me one time, I don't make my athletes stronger, I don't make people stronger, I just get people to move better. And there's, you know, it's kind of a funny, simple thing to say, but if you really think about it, it makes a lot of sense, is that getting stronger is so predicated on how you move, and loading the right areas, and being efficient, that if you are not placing emphasis on that, and it's just about a cookie cutter, this is how you squat sort of approach, you're, you're, you're at the very least not going to be getting as much out of a program as you, you perhaps could if you really, really focus on the quality of your movement over, you know, specific, you know, black and white cues that, that, that everyone says you need to do. I mean, don't get me wrong, there's some, some, some definitely some, some key pointers that universally translate to a good squat. However, being tied to those things, you know, you're just limiting yourself. Yeah, and so today that's what we're going to talk about is the universal things that you can definitely use to make your squat look better. So guys, the first thing we're going to be talking about when it comes to commonalities or kind of things that universally translate over to just about anyone's squat, first and foremost is the neutral spine. The reason why the neutral spine will translate, doesn't matter what technique you're using, you want a neutral spine. The reason why is because that's how you brace your core. That's how you create your intra-abdominal pressure to stabilize your spine. Um, you know, to, to kind of give you an idea of what we're talking about with neutral spine, what we're talking about is literally the, the neutral alignment of the, the, the disc in your vertebrae and your lumbar in, in particular portion of your spine. The human body can handle thousands and thousands of pounds of load with, with the, the vertebrae stacked right on top of each other. If you get to a little bit, a couple degrees of flexion or extension, it, it goes down to a couple hundred pounds. So that's why it's such an important thing. Also, I saw, you know, Ben's made a video in the past where you want to get six pack, six pack abs, focus on that bracing, on getting that neutral spine, because that is how you engage your deep core musculature to keep that in, intra-abdominal pressure. And real quick, I want to go over how you get that because I feel like this is something that people miss out on is the breathing, okay? So you got two, two types of breaths that we typically use. You get your big chest breath, which is what you don't want. That's what you do not want when you're lifting, okay? You want to get that air into your belly, so you get that big belly breath, and then you brace, and that's when you engage the glutes, tighten that deep core musculature, like your, your transverse abdominis, that kind of stuff, to tuck the hips under the body, okay? Literally, nothing is flexed, nothing is, or excuse me, nothing's extended, nothing's excessively flexed, everything's nice and stacked on top of each other. You don't see any you know, arching in the lower back, nothing like that. It essentially, it's good posture, okay? So, it coordinates with that big belly breath to get that neutral spine. Uh, the best way I, I, I kind of heard it, uh, Describe is if you have a, a, a string attached from your chin to your belly button, what you should be able to do is narrow that gap without your chest really moving. Because you see how it's moving at the hips, tucking underneath, engaging, as opposed to 
pulling the chest forward. That's not what you're looking to do. It's all about movement in, you know, in the midsection and the hips as opposed to movement elsewhere in your shoulders or hyperextending back, anything like that. Yeah, so Mike mentioned lumbar spine, most important part of kind of that neutral spine. Totally right. The other parts of your spine are important too, especially your thoracic spine. So what you're trying to get is the strongest kind of pillar that you can from your feet all the way up to your head. And so if I have a nice tight lumbar spine with my core braced, but then I'm arching the fuck out of my, my upper back, which sometimes you see people do on the squat because they think it's going to make them more upright. If I'm doing that, I'm losing all this power that should be going from my hips to the bar. It's just fucking dissipating and it's going to put me in a bad position. The upright portion of your squat comes from keeping the neutral spine and it comes from engaging your hips and your lower body properly. Absolutely, yep. So I'm going to get under the bar, you're going to see what it looks like because, in my opinion, the easiest way to see the impact of a neutral spine is to walk out of a squat. So first I'm going to show you what I see most people doing in the gym. Most people, they come up to the bar, first of all they don't even take their time to get set, they get under here and they're like this, they got their hips way back over here and they're arching the bar out of the rack. Almost trying to do fucking partial good morning or some shit. Terrible position to be in. First of all, under heavy weight it's just not going to work. The bar's not going to move anywhere. Second of all, you're putting yourself in a terrible position from the start because then it's incredibly difficult to get in that brace position with heavy weight on your back. So you need to start out in a good neutral spine position. When I get under the bar, I make sure if my feet are directly below the bar, I tuck my hips under, I straighten that thoracic spine, and then I lift off by squeezing my glutes. There's no lower back in there, there's maybe a little bit of quad, but that's almost all glutes right there. You gotta set the bar at the right position so that you can get it high enough just by squeezing your glutes, which is difficult sometimes, especially if you don't have nice equipment, but very, very important if you're trying to lift as much weight as you possibly can. Real quick now, to, to bring in the strongman world into how it pertains to the strongman world, what is this like? A yoke pick. And that is the number one thing I probably see people do wrong with their yoke pick is their feet are way away from the bar and so when they go to pick it up, it's all lower back. You're not getting any help from the hips, you're getting no economy of movement, you're not keeping that torso nice and vertical in that neutral spine position. So I cannot agree with Ben Moore and uh, his emphasis on how important just picking the damn bar out of the rack is. And so these are the little things that so many people take for granted or, or, or are never coached in, but makes such a huge difference in setting you up for the entire position that you're going to be doing your squat in. So getting your hips underneath the bar, getting that position before you even get that, that, that weight you know, loaded on your spine is going to be critically uh, important to, to set you up for a good squat. be going over now is the rack position when it comes to squatting. I'd say this is, uh, along with the neutral spine, one of the top things that people forget about or do not pay attention to or emphasize you know, as it pertains to their squat. You know, it's very easy you know, when we're in high school or you're doing you know, strength and conditioning for the football or whatever it is, you just get under the bar, you know, you think about it, well, however it is, right? Not what you want to do. Especially when you're looking to move heavy loads, uh, you know, um, with the bar on your back, you need to really emphasize that rack position. So for me, I had surgery on this shoulder, uh, labrum tear. As you can see, the shoulder mobility, right side's good, left side's about as far back as I can get without mobilizing it. So stay tuned for our next video. Is that turn sideways, show. Okay, yeah. So you can see that difference there, that external rotation, which means getting under the bar without mobilizing the shoulder, inevitably I'm going to be twisted to the side a little bit to compensate for that. So for me, when I'm squatting, I have to really emphasize shoulder mobility, especially on this left side, just to get into the right position. So stay tuned for the next video, you know, when we go over shoulder mobility a little bit more, more specifically, uh, to kind of see some specific movements, but mobilizing the shoulders through, you know, mashing the back of the shoulder there, mashing the chest, a little bit of external rotation to just loosen up that tissue and a couple specific stretches can really, really help to just open up that external rotation and be able to get you under the bar. So when we're talking about under the bar, what we're talking about is not chicken wing, okay? So one of the things that is a pet peeve of mine is when I see people get under the bar, and then they just go elbows up, right? You notice that, you see what that does to the entire position of my back. Inevitably, I'm gonna be more prone to arching that thoracic spine as Ben was talking about, as opposed to thinking about wrapping the bar around, getting the elbows down so that the elbows are underneath the bar. The reason why this is important is, if you think about it, when you're coming up from a squat, and for someone like me who's more prone to having that acute torso angle, if I put pressure into the bar, 
what am I doing? I'm collapsing my chest forward and not allowing for any drive into the bar. So by having the elbows up and back, you're A, arching that thoracic spine, not keeping that neutral spine, but also more prone to collapsing your chest. So by really thinking about wrapping that bar around you, tightening those lats, getting them in tight, allows you to really keep that chest up and drive up into the bar as opposed to driving your chest forward and you know, shifting your weight onto your toes and all that good stuff. So getting that rack position is gonna be very, very important for just the overall economy of movement and keeping that neutral spine. And you see how everything is tied together. You, got, you can't have one without the other, essentially. Like I was saying, upper back tightness, getting in that right shoulder position, absolutely crucial for having a good rack position. That said, for me, even if I'm doing a lot of shoulder mobilization, I do, I do a lot of shoulder rehab, prehab work, I get a lot of soft tissue work, I still have trouble getting under the bar in a proper position when I'm beginning my workout. So I'm gonna show you all a few things that I do, a few little tricks that you can use to help warm up your shoulders before you start squatting. Number one, you can do a little light bench before you squat, that's gonna get the, you know, little blood flow through that whole thing, but not, not always necessary. So. When I'm squatting, I start my hands very close together. They are almost on, it's hard to see, but they are almost on the smooth part of that bar. I cannot for the life of me get under the bar in that position when I first start squatting. When I first start squatting, my hands are almost all the way out against the rack. That's the only way that I can get my elbows under the bar well enough to even approximate a good squat. So I start out all the way under here. And over the course of a workout, I probably can't show you all right now, I'm bringing it in all the way like this. So that's one thing, is that as you go, you can start with a wide, wide grip and you can slowly bring it in. That's gonna give your shoulders a little bit of time to adjust. The other thing that I do is I take what's called a talon grip or an eagle grip, claw grip. Basically, what I'm doing is taking a thumbless grip and then I'm dropping my pinky under the bar. And by dropping my pinky under the bar, I give myself a little bit more rotation around the wrist. I make it much easier to push my elbows under the bar without straining anything up in here. All right, it is gonna put a little bit more strain on my wrist. That's why I get very tight, tight wrist wraps, give that joint a lot of support. But that way, I can get better shoulder mobility without having to spend hours and hours trying to get my shoulders loose before I start squatting. So, all said, it looks kinda like this. Take that thumbless grip, get even, drop the pinkies. Right like that. Um, one other thing when you're setting your rack position, I think a lot of people ignore the importance of the lats in your squat. So this is kind of a tricky one because you don't necessarily think of it right away, but like Mike was saying, it's the same idea as if you're chicken winging with your arms, you're gonna be pushing yourself forward. You wanna use your lats to pull yourself back, keep yourself upright. So the way I do that, when I get set for the bar, I grab with an underhand position, I externally rotate my shoulders, and I pull down as much as I can, just like I'm doing a lat pull down. That lets me feel a little bit of tightness in that lat, before I get under the bar. Then once I get under the bar, I try to keep that tight position with my lower lats, and with my upper lats, I try to flare just a little bit. I'm gonna show you, it might be a little bit difficult to see, but this is what it looks like. So tight lats, pull down. And then right here, I'm gonna flare just a little bit. It's gonna give me a better base to squat from. It's gonna make me, I can kind of push into those lats as I descend, keep my torso more upright. And as I'm coming up, I can really think about driving back into those lats so that I don't lose the position while I'm squatting. All right, guys, so uh, real quick, I want to go over uh, bar position for uh, high bar, or excuse me, head position for high bar or low bar squatting, okay? Uh, a lot of people think, you know, um, neutral, neutral head position for everything. And I would say for most things, yes. However, for a high bar squat, for example, you want to get a little bit more extension in that cervical area than you would for a low bar. For a low bar, you're going to keep, you know, more so keep that neutral head position uh, and not be flexing or extending the head too much. So, for a high bar squat, which I've been doing a lot lately to really load my quads and get uh, keep that upright torso and really work on that. Okay. When I come out, shoulders are actually mobilized kind of nicely right now. I'm going to kind of think about extending just a little bit. I'm not going to hyper extend way back. I'm gonna think about extending just a little bit more in my neutral head position here. So I'm gonna get my eyes up just a touch to really help keep that uh, uh, chest upright as I'm you know, coming up from the squat. Now for a low bar squat, this might be a little bit tough for me to get into right now because once again, the shoulder mobility, you wanna keep that head in that neutral position just like you're deadlifting. Okay? So getting under the bar, get a low bar position there. That's actually not too bad today. 
I'm going to keep much more neutral head position here. So you see how I'm not hyperextending here. I'm not even having a straight head position. I'm getting that neutral head position just like I'm walking down the street, wrapping that bar around, elbows down, tight lats. Throughout the whole movement. Okay. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I remember back in high school, you know, good old football coach coaching the strength movements. He said, head up, head up, keep your head up, keep your chest up. And that goes back to that hyperextension of the thoracic area. It will help contribute to that, and it's not something you want. So you want to make sure you have the head in the right position according to what movement you're doing in terms of high bar or low bar squatting. So if you guys remember last time, we talked a pretty good amount about the importance of mobility in your ankles, your calves, your feet. And that's actually a huge part of being able to squat and recruit the proper muscles very easily. So, a little embarrassing. I actually didn't know what the midfoot was until pretty recently. So, maybe I can show you all. But I started thinking that my midfoot was kind of like right behind the ball of my foot. Midfoot is actually closer to where your ankle meets your foot. And that's actually a very important distinction because if you're trying to press most of the weight through your through the ball of your foot, you're going to come forward a lot. It's going to be difficult to keep your heels on the ground even with uh, Olympic weightlifting shoes and it's also going to shift a lot of the emphasis away from your posterior chain where generally you want to balance between your posterior chain and your quads when you're squatting. Very important and a lot of times you'll hear guys who say oh no you got to sit back in the squat, you got to sit back, sit back or you hear people who say the squat's entirely a quad movement right and it should be all quads and your hamstrings and glutes really aren't primary movers. The trick is to have a balance, and the balance is going to depend, again, on your leverages and on your muscular strengths and weaknesses, so it's difficult to say what's right for everyone. Personally, if I try to do a big sit-back squat, I'm in a very weak position, and because my lower back is kind of a, a strong point relative to all the other muscles in my body, I end up doing more of a good morning. So for me, it's very important to really actively think about getting that quad involvement. For other people, it's more important to think about sitting back. But regardless of which style you use, regardless of the width of your stance, you want to be feeling the weight through the midfoot. Now, at the same time, that doesn't mean that you're trying to pull both your toes and heels up at the same time, right? That's not going to work. You want to feel your weight over kind of three points in your foot, right? So through your heel, through your little toe, through your big toe. That's going to give you a very stable base, just like a tripod. But then as you do, as you descend in the squat, think about feeling the weight through your midfoot. It might take a little bit of practice, it might take a little mobilization. Again, go back and watch our last video, but over time you're going to find that it's much, much easier to recruit all the muscles in your lower body if you're doing that properly, and it's going to be easier to keep an upright torso position. Alright guys, so, so uh, kind of to, to piggyback on what Ben was saying about where you want to feel the weight you know, uh, distribution in your feet when you're squatting, uh, we're going to kind of go over ideal footwear. Okay, So if you look at the shoes that uh, Ben and I are wearing right now, for as a matter of fact, you know, I'm wearing you know, a, a Chuck. Uh, Chuck Taylor's classic uh, you know, uh, rubber with some canvas on it. The reason why I like to wear these for most of my lifting is because there's no cushion, there's no arch support, so it really allows me to distribute my weight where I want to distribute it as opposed to the shoe kind of dictating. So for example, you know, when I see people wearing running shoes or you know, the cross country or you know, cro uh, cross training shoes or whatever, um, I always tell them to take their, their, their shoes off when squatting because that big cushy heel, A, you're very unstable if you have a lot of support and cushioning on the bottom of your shoe. So it's going to you know, cause you to react to where that, that cushioning wants you to. Uh, distribute your weight as opposed to you di dictating where you distribute your weight. So getting a nice flat shoe with uh, little to no arch support. So like I, I always recommend Chuck Taylor's, you know, um, Reebok has some of their like Nanos and stuff like that. Uh, Ben's actually wearing a, a pair of some Reeboks with a nice flat heel um, and, and little to no arch support. Even something like the good old Adidas Sambas, you know, very little arch support if you have like very, very low arches or no arches just to keep that, that support there just a little bit so your knees aren't pronating. But really not having that big cushy heel. Now, you're, now you're going to say, what about Olympic lifting shoes? So many people wear those. That's a little bit of a different story with that solid heel, okay? That's going to be more so for people with ankle mobility issues, or for me, I like to wear them when I'm trying to really load my quads and, and, and get more activation in my quads as opposed to my posterior, because earlier I was saying that when I squat, I'm a little bit more posterior chain dominant, so I want to force the activation and recruitment of my quads by wearing those Olympic lifting shoes. I will say though that if you can't squat properly without Olympic lifting shoes, you need to check out our other video and work on that ankle mobility because without that ankle mobility, you cannot get it. You know, you cannot distribute the weight as you want to. You know, your immobilities is going to force you to shift forward on those toes, which is then going to 
cause that chest to fall forward and create more of a torso angle, which means what are you gonna do on the way up? On the toes, hips are rising, then you're gonna be good morning that weight up. So what type of shoes you wear um, are gonna really help dictate how, how well you can get into position and distribute your weight, as well as your ankle mobility um, and your hip mobility, because if you cannot externally rotate the hips enough to really open the hips and sit back on that midfoot or slash heels, you're screwed. You're going to be shifting forward to the toes, chest is going to fall forward, low back is going to be getting some flexion at the bottom of the squat. So you really want to make sure you're picking the right shoes to wear and also working on your mobility when necessary uh, so that you can get into the right position and not, and not put the rest of that chain in a bad position and cause other areas to do work that, uh, you know, like your legs and hips should be doing, for example. So next thing we're going to cover is the descent of the squat. This, in my opinion, usually more important than the ascent of the squat because if you're going to make a strong, solid descent, you're in a good position in the hole, it's fairly easy to come out of the hole, keeping a good position. So the first and kind of most important thing, in my, my opinion, is how you initiate the descent. So there's kind of three different options you have here. You can break at the knees first, right? Like an Olympic weightlifter, really, really push those knees forward, getting all the all the load on your quads. It's gonna have a, a good amount of forward knee displacement. You're gonna keep you very upright. That's one option. Other option is complete opposite, right? You're sitting all the way back, you're keeping your knees as straight as possible, keeping your shins, keeping your shins as straight as possible, really loading that posterior chain, hamstrings, glutes. In my opinion, for most people, right? So it's gonna depend, again, Olympic weightlifter, you're gonna to wanna to push your knees forward. If you compete equipped and powerlifting, you're gonna to wanna to sit back. But for most raw powerlifters, you're gonna want a, a, a nice happy medium where you're bringing up the knees and hips simultaneously, which allows you to load your quads and your posterior chain simultaneously. Absolutely, I, I agree with you a million percent that, um, especially when you say I like the distinction between geared powerlifters because you're looking to load as much energy in that suit to help you get out of the hole as possible. So we're talking kind of more like a west side type squat, you know, especially with the box squats and stuff. And then you know, we saw my Olympic lifters. The other people I would lump into that category is bodybuilders. You'll see them with a very narrow base, really shifting the knees forward, really just targeting those quads. So once again, it just goes back to what you're looking to accomplish. What we're talking about here is primarily maximum efficiency uh, for the average person, uh, you know, average raw lifter in particular. So when he's talking about breaking, he's, he's referring to simultaneously pushing the hips back, creating what's called the block in your lower back and hips and also bending those knees to load everything simultaneously. This is gonna keep you in a pretty upright position and load everything just about evenly. Now, inevitably, the squat is a quad dominant movement or a knee dominant movement, so you're gonna be loading the quads more, those are gonna be the agonists, but as much as you can, get those synergists working, you know, your hamstrings, you know, glutes, lower back, uh, as much as possible to help, you know, with the lift. You know, the way I put it is, if you can get more major muscles working on a lift, you might as well. So, breaking simultaneously for most people is going to be the best option and get help you get the most out of you know of your leverages depending on who you are. The same thing, kind of trying to find that happy medium, generally applies to the speed of your descent. So you'll see some lifters they dive on dive on their squats, right? I'm thinking of Shane Hammond right now, but. When he squats, he's gonna be almost, it looks like he's not even in control of the weight, right? You barely see that descent, and all of a sudden he's coming up. Other people have a very, very slow, controlled descent where it's almost like they're searching, they're creeping for depth. And what they're doing most of the time is trying to stay as tight as possible, trying to keep every muscle in their body loaded throughout the entire movement so that they're in control of the bar the entire way down. Again, this is going to be very individual, but generally what you're looking for is some sort of happy medium where you're in control of the bar, but at the same time you're not descending so slowly that you're wasting a lot of energy. It's kind of a difficult medium to find because you know it's, it's much easier to go from one extreme to the other. But there's some issues. I already mentioned that you know if you're going very, very slowly, a lot of people, most people, are probably going to be expending too much energy on that descent. The flip side is if you're dive bombing, a lot of people are going to have difficulty maintaining balance, maintaining their weight over that midfoot, right? A lot of times you're going to see people shifting forward, then as they come out of the hole, they try to balance, but instead their hips just shoot up and their chest doesn't really move. So they're not really transferring any of that energy, transferring any of that stretch reflex, and so they just don't get, end up getting pancaked with heavy weight. So you're looking for kind of a balance there as well. Absolutely, uh, I'm, I think this is something that's not talked about enough when it comes to squatting is the tempo. Because 
Some people are going to want more kind of like what I call the coil, where it's kind of like a spring. If you're pushing down the coil, it's going to take a lot more time to push it down than you let it uncoil, right? So we're talking about the descent is that coil, where you're kind of taking your time, finding your balance, keeping tight, and on the way up is when you want to be a little more explosive. That's how I found I need to squat, because if I kind of just dive bomb, as Ben so eloquently put it, I'm going to lose my tightness. You know, I'm going to shift forward my toes because I'm already kind of prone to that acute torso angle, and I'm going to just lose it forward. So. Did, you know, finding how, uh, you know, what your tempo is going to be very important, like you said, that happy medium. What I've found to be really effective at, at helping you determine that is something like speed squats, where you're you know, taking a sub-maximal weight and you're trying to move it with maximal efficiency, maximal bar speed, um, and that can really help you determine, okay, that rep felt really good when you know, I was you know, going to maybe, maybe about a two count tempo down as opposed to a one count. Because for me, when I'm going down you know, super fast and trying to get that stretch reflex, I lose tightness, but I also lose some stability in my knees. So knees are gonna be diving in, which means my hips aren't gonna be working as much. So yeah, hips are gonna shoot up, chest is gonna dive forward. So find Finding that, that tempo for you is going to be uh, important. I will say that no matter who you are, unless you're you know, a bodybuilder or somewhere where you're doing specific tempo work to keep tension on the legs, is you want that explosive ascent. You want to be trying to drive as hard as you can out of that hole, generating as much speed as possible. Now, I will also say that if you have the ability to maintain your tightness and maintain your balance, have a nice upright torso with a fast ascent, you're going to get much more of a stretch reflex out of it. And so you're going to get a lot out of that if you can do it. But it's one of those things where you know you're kind of you might be you know robbing Peter to pay Paul essentially where getting that extra speed on the way down is going to make you lose efficiency in terms of your weight distribution, uh, tightness, and all that, and, and, and kind of fuck up your economy movement as opposed to you know adding to it. What Mike just said is even more important if you squat in wraps versus in sleeves, right? So we already made the distinction between equipped powerlifters and raw powerlifters. If you're squatting in wraps. Wraps are all about that stretch reflex. So generally, with almost every rep, the faster you go down, the more rebound you're going to get out. Again, this depends on the style of wrap you're using, the tightness of the wrap, but almost always that's going to be the case. So if you're a lifter who has a very slow, tight descent, like Mike said, the coil or the spring, you got to think of your wraps now as that coil, as that spring. You gotta trust them to really load them as fast as you can while maintaining that balance. Just like in sleeves, if you lose that balance, you're fucked, right? Like, you're not gonna recover from that with heavy weight. So that's always number one, but you have to be especially mindful of your descent and the speed of your descent when you're squatting in reps. So once you make a strong descent, you're in the hole, you're in a good, stable position, right? And then you have to come out of the hole. Now generally, you don't have to think about that that much because your natural instinct's gonna be get the fuck out of there, so you're just gonna stand up. However, depending on how you're built, depending on your you know balances, strengths, weaknesses, all that, you might run into some issues. So we're gonna talk about a few of the common ones. The one that I think I see the most is hips rising fast from the chest, right? Doing the good morning squat. So instead of going down and coming up in a nice smooth pattern, where you're like that and that, instead you're going down, hips are shooting up, chest is falling down. With heavy weight, obviously you can't maintain that, so you just fall forward. So the solution to this issue is again balance. So as you're going down, you need to be especially mindful to balance the load between your quads and your posterior chain. There's kind of two ways you can get around this, right? So a lot of people say that, well, if your hips are rising faster than your chest, that means your glutes aren't firing enough out of the hole. I'd say most of the time that is the case, right? Because if your glutes are firing correctly, they're gonna almost pull your, your hips under your chest, and so you're not gonna be able to shoot them back um, or shoot them up without your hips rising, without your chest rising as well, excuse me. However, sometimes people just have very weak quads and they can't extend their knees properly. So instead, what they end up doing is shooting those hips up, essentially working around the quads, right? Putting themselves in a position, putting their bodies in a position where they don't have to use the quads to extend their legs. So let me show you real quick. If I'm using my quads, right? I'm gonna come down, I'll load those quads. I'm gonna feel the weight through my quads as I come up. But if I can't use my quads, if they're shut down, if they're weak, whatever the case may be, I can go down like this, if I come up like this, my quads aren't doing anything right here. But from here, I can use my glutes and my low back to raise that bar up. It's a good morning. It's literally a good morning. But I'm doing that, in this case, because my quads aren't strong enough to get me out of that whole position. So it's an important distinction to make. It's important to be honest with yourself or have a good coach watching you so they can tell you, hey, which case is it and what can I do to fix it? Yeah. So piggyback on what he's saying, 
Uh, that's what I used to do big time, especially in like high school and stuff before I really got into you know the, the technical aspect of lifting. Is like I like I've said a couple times, my posterior chain is my strength. My my quads, eh, moderately strong, but on a squat, definitely my weakness. So what I would do subconsciously, once again, it goes back to your brain is is, is a very very smart you know tool when it comes to you know moving your body. It's going to load the area that it knows can handle whatever you're trying to do. So essentially, what you're doing is when you know, when you go down and get all that knee uh, flexion at the bottom, your posterior chain isn't loaded. So what your body is going do is kind of shoot the hips up to then get a load on that area, your hamstrings, glutes, lower back, and like you said, you're good morning it up. So it's a compensation for sure. Now the other thing I'd add to what Ben was saying is it could be weak quads, but it could also be a weak core to keep the torso upright, or you're not bracing correctly to keep the torso upright and transfer that power from your feet all the way up through the, your, you know, your torso into the bar. So there's a couple different things that could be, once again, why it's so important to have a good coach you know, working with you one-on-one -on -one with eyes on or at least seeing your videos to kind of help you determine which of it is, or it could be a combination of those things. Um, so for me, it's not a weak core, it's not really as much you know issues uh, in, in mobility, it's more so I just need to get my quads stronger. So I'm doing a lot of front squats, a lot of zercher squats, Bulgarian split squats, things along those lines to really focus on uh, you know that engagement. And earlier I touched on also doing a high bar squat. I do pretty much exclusively high bar squats because they're gonna load those quads a lot more because the bar is gonna be right over that midfoot and really be in a position to load those quads. So all high bar squatting, I don't really do low bar squatting to load the hips. Um, especially because I'm not looking to be a competition power lift. I'm just looking to get my quads strong for, in particular, my deadlift because off the floor is where I'm having issues right now. And so loading my quads a little bit more and getting my quads stronger is going to carry over more to my deadlifts, for example. So what this also kind of, you know, kind of brings to my mind is work on your weaknesses. It'd be very easy for me to deadlift all day, do posterior chain work, do you know heavy carries because that's what I'm really good at. But by addressing my weaknesses, it's gonna make me better at what I'm good at. So making sure that you're addressing those weaknesses on your list and being able to identify what your weaknesses are on the list is gonna have a carryover to things that you didn't even realize it did because you know once you do it, you're like, oh, why is my deadlift up? I haven't been even working on my deadlift. Well, maybe that shows that you aren't getting enough quads up at the start of your deadlift. So working on these weaknesses is critical. Don't be one of those guys that goes in and just does what you like. Hammer those weaknesses. How about the, the issue of knees getting? A lot of times that has to do with uh, overall hip mobility as well as ankle mobility because we touched on it earlier. If you can't really screw your heels into the ground and get that excellent rotation of the femur, which in essence shuts off your hip flexors, that tight so as it's pulling you forward and then not allowing those glutes to fire, that's what's going to largely call, cause your knees to cave in, you know, uh, as well as your chest to dive forward because you're not able to act, you know, activate your glutes for a number of reasons. This could be due to the tight hip flexors, like I said, or you just have weak, you know, abductors and you know, lateral muscles that, that help to stabilize the knee. So if you're someone who's done a lot of work in the sagittal plane, so sagittal plane, you know, being squats, bicep curls, doing the kind of typical bodybuilder movements. Let's say you didn't, you know, do much sports as you know, as a kid or something like that, where there is that lateral movement. It might just be that you have weakness in those muscles, you know, that control the abduction you know, or the stabilization of your knees, which then in turn doesn't allow that glute maxifier, which is going to make it a lot of lower back and, and even make that, that chest dipping forward and hip shooting up issue even worse. So this is why we were talking about earlier, it's not just a one size fits all sort of thing. There's, there, you know, these problems can be caused by so many different issues that figuring out what it is for you is going to be critical. And we're just going to give you some, some options as, as to what it could be and you know, potentially help you figure it out on your own. So since we don't want to overload you guys with information, we're going to kind of wrap up this section of the video. Uh, next, we're going to show you how both Mike and I squat, as we've talked before. We both have different strengths, different weaknesses. Mike's more posterior chain, I'm more quad dominant, quad lower back dominant. And so you're gonna see some of the differences and what they translate into in our squatting technique. Now, one of the reasons we don't wanna go on and on and on about these commonalities that you want is because as you alter your squat form, right, to address weaknesses, you need to make sure that you do that process slowly. If you try to make a bunch of changes all at once, A, you're not gonna know what's working, what's not working. B, you're gonna increase the risk of injury or increase the risk of putting yourself in an even worse position. So as you go, as you start revising your squat, start with one issue at a time. Whatever you think the most important thing is or whatever your coach thinks the most important thing is, start with that, address that, figure out how to fix that. Change one thing workout until you find something that clicks. You might have to stick with it for more than one workout. You have to be persistent, you have to be patient with it. It takes a long time, it takes a lot of patience to figure out the perfect technique. But once you do, that's gonna translate into continued gains over the course of your lifting career. So, 
I'm going to start, I'm going to show you what my squat looks like. I've already kind of explained why I do the things that I do, so you're just going to see how it all comes together. I'm going to get under the bar, take a fairly narrow stance, pull my lats down and under, brace, right, get that good neutral spine, that tight upper back with elbows under the bar, unrack with my glutes, step back, those tight lats. As I go down, my weight's over my midfoot, smoothly, I'm coming back up. All right, so everything Ben said was absolutely correct. I mean, he, I cannot overemphasize what he said in regards to incrementally making these changes because if you just throw the kitchen sink at yourself, it's just kind of like it's kind of like nutrition. You know what I mean? If you all of a sudden do a 180 on your nutrition and just try to you know go from from dirty to clean, so to speak, it's, it's you're going to burn yourself out. And you're not going to know what works for you. So it's the same thing when it comes to lifting. Do these things incrementally. So great example. I just started working with Ben's awesome girlfriend Stacy, and we just retooled her deadlift. The first rep she did, she said, well, that, that felt weaker. And then, well, yeah, it's gonna feel weaker because you're placing emphasis on an area that you potentially weren't placing emphasis, so it's weak in regards to this movement pattern. However, you get that stimulus to that area, you know, as it should, it's gonna get stronger, and it's gonna feel better and better and better. And so what I'm talking about was her deadlift. You know, she's a quad dominant deadlifter, so by not loading her posterior, she's getting a lot out of those quads, but then she's hit a ceiling where she's like, man, my deadlift hasn't gone up. Yeah, because once you hit a certain point of, you know, your compensatory movement isn't going to take you any further. So making sure to incrementally make these changes, find what is and what isn't working for you, but also being patient with it. Like Ben said, it's not going to take just one session. Potentially it's going to be months of, of toying with the, these different positions and these different tweaks that we're talking about until, okay, now it's starting to click. I'm starting to feel that strength there. Okay, so real quick, I'm going to go over how I like to get in my squat position. I like to go as narrow as I can. Now, I can't quite get as narrow as Ben just because I left shoulder in particular. Um, I, I'm trying to work on the thumbless grip, speaking of making tweaks. Uh, ben, actually, I'm going to be trying that talon grip here pretty soon, but since I haven't tried it quite yet, I'm going to just do what I normally do, wrapping the thumb around the bar. So I'm going to get under the bar, just like he said, setting my feet first in that bar position. Okay? Then I'm going to brace at the midsection, getting that air, make sure I get that big belly breath. Okay. Walking it out, just two or three steps. That's the other thing I see people do. They take a nice big journey away from the rack. No need to do that. Just one, two or maybe three steps out, get your position, okay? One thing I like to do before I, I uh, descend is A, with that bracing, is kind of really squeeze those glutes so that once I descend, they're ready to pop right out of the hole because most people uh, are quad dominant squatters and they're not getting enough out of those glutes in the posterior chain. So by thinking about engaging them and really squeezing the, the glutes and then keeping uh, the abs tight to get that neutral spine and then getting your another breath. And get that good extension at the top. Okay, that's the other thing I like to emphasize with my athletes is because it's a quad dominant movement, once you're at the top, you kind of forget about that engagement. But the more you're thinking about engaging those glutes, the more they're gonna help you pop out of that hole and get more stimulus to them and get stronger. So that's it for kind of the explanation portion of the video. For the rest of the time, we're just going to answer some of the questions and answers we've got on Instagram. Honestly, I didn't get as many as I expected, so if y'all like this video, if you're interested, you have more questions, make sure you ask them. You know, you can email either one of us, you can check out our websites, you can ask me on Lead FTS, you can ask me on Instagram, I'm sure the same for Mike. Um, but yeah, let us know what you're interested in, because it's hard for us to, to know what, what you guys need work on. So, um, Ron D asks, learning to keep tension and position out of the bottom of the hole, which is a great question. So, what, what's your go-to for, for maintaining tension in the hole? Breathing. I mean, I can, uh, yeah, as I've touched on a couple times, most people do not understand what the breathing is doing. And so, to, to quickly explain what the breathing is doing is, you know, I, I, I have this sense that people think that, you know, to, to keep a neutral spine and brace your core, your muscles are like literally wrapping around your spine and your, your internal organs and all that. That's not what your muscles are, that's not what your core musculature is doing to engage, or to, excuse me, to stabilize your torso. Your, your core musculature is keeping that intra-abdominal pressure that you are creating through your breath. So if you're not getting a big enough breath and really expanding that, that abdomen, you are not getting that intra-abdominal pressure that is so necessary to stabilize the torso, which then in turn decreases your, your uh, economy of movement, aka efficiency of that power transfer, transfer through your uh, legs all the way up through your body. So breathing, 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 getting that big breath, belly breath before you start your descent, keeping that breath until you are coming out of the hole and almost finishing the lift, okay? And so that's why you'll see 
every big name lifter, if you watch every good lifter, whether it's powerlifting, Olympic lifting, what do they? What do you see them do? What's the commonality right before they go? You can hear it. You can see it. You can see that expansion. You can see that tightness that it creates. You know, it's that simultaneous getting that breath. So breathing, getting that big belly breath, and holding it, and bracing until you are coming out of the hole. I totally agree. I think if you were to ask me, the number one thing to stay tight in the deadlift is breathing. Tight in the squat, you know, excuse me. However, more generally, I think a lot of people don't quite understand the concept of tightness. Tightness is directly related to strength. The stronger you are, the easier it's going to be to stay tight. So if you're having trouble keeping any particular muscle group tight, right? You're having trouble keeping your hamstrings tight on the center of the squat, having trouble keeping your glutes tight in the deadlift, having trouble keeping your pecs tight on the bench, anything like that, it means that muscle is relatively weak. So you need to strengthen that muscle. And that's where accessory work, that's where variation, that's where hypertrophy work, all that stuff, that's where that comes in. It's very important because if you don't address that, it's almost asking for injury. But don't get don't get confused with thinking, oh, well, I'm thinking about the muscle and so it's tight. You have to have strength in that muscle as well. And to, to add on to what he's saying, I, I, yeah, I mean, he said it beautifully. The one thing I would also emphasize with that is sometimes it's not necessarily the strength to do it once. Perhaps it's your strength endurance. It's the endurance of that muscle tissue. It's in the endurance of that connected tissue that's supporting that muscle tissue. And so doing things, like you said, like a little bit more high rep hypertrophy work to, in, to you know, encourage and build that endurance of that muscle group. So for example, on bench press, if you're having a hard time really keeping that upper back tight, it might be, you know, overall that area is weak, but it might also be that it lacks endurance to be able to stay in that position for long enough, you know, to keep yourself tight on the bench. So working the endurance aspect of it is, is almost equally as important, um, you know, as is building the strength. And obviously they're very closely tied, doing enough repetitions to build up that muscle and actually make it bigger, you know, bigger muscles equal, equal better leverages. Um, but, but not neglecting any aspect of your training. What it goes back to is, you know, that multifaceted approach, making sure you're doing your mobility, recovery, the endurance work, the speed work, the strength work, the power work, not just being a specialist uh, necessarily. Now, obviously, you want to be a specialist on those three lifts, but making sure that you cover all your bases on those three lifts. So, next question, Johnson BDJ asks, what's kind of shorts am I wearing? These are Elite FTS French Terry. I own like 20 pairs. Uh, you can get them on the site. The secret to making your quads look extra big is just to size down two sizes. I do that in my shirt and my shorts. So I'm around 5'8", 215 right now, and I'm wearing a size small shirt and size small pants. So there you go. <laughs> um, let's see, what else? Uh, Yeti Coolers asks, would you address hand numbness during higher rep sets and how to maximize stretch reflex in the hole? Ever had hand num numbness during higher reps? Uh, I can't say I've had numbness uh, as much as I've just had, especially on this left shoulder that's less mobile, pain in the hand and kind of a stretching feeling up into the palm there. I don't think I've really had numbness. Honestly, that, that, that sounds like you need to really address some shoulder mobility because it sounds like you're impinging a nerve potentially being in that position. Uh, and so just addressing overall shoulder mobility, especially soft tissue work, is going to really help out that. Yeah. Uh, I can't really speak to hand numbness. I've never had that. Again, if it's pain in your hands, extra tight knee wrap, pain or wrist, extra tight wrist wraps can help for that issue. Uh, staying tight in the squat and kind of rebound in the squat, I feel like we addressed that issue already. Yeah. Uh, again, make sure you're mindful of what your goals are, what kind of equipment you're using. But yeah, if you still have questions, go back and watch the video again. Um, let's see, what else? How much baby powder do I go through each session? Half a bottle. Uh, mm -hmm. So you can push my way at 215. Real quick, another thing that works real well in, in place of baby powder is coconut oil. Just make sure you don't get that on your hands and then your grips go up. I don't think that's allowed in a powerless. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm talking about training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, G slays them all, asks, uh, at what weight do you throw your belt on? Um... It really depends on what where I'm at in my cycle. Uh, like at the beginning of a cycle, like just you know, these past I'm, I'm three weeks into my accumulation phase, coming off the hypertrophy phase. Um, very very seldom using a belt right now. Uh, it's, it's a little bit lighter work. It's a little bit higher volume, and I'm trying to build that core strength back. So I don't want to be using that belt in place of building the core strength. Uh, I'd say generally speaking, on squats, anything anything over about four on deadlifts, really anything over about 450. Uh, you know, I'll start throwing the belt on, but it really depends on how I'm feeling that day and also what I'm looking to accomplish with that session and, and you know, kind of what I know is coming next in the workout. You know, if I know that 
all I'm doing is deadlifts and I'm really trying to hammer my lower back strength and get my core strength up, you know, I'll throw the belt on for maybe a set or two towards the end of, you know, towards my top sets. But it, it all kind of depends on what you So personally, I wear my belt for every set, even when I'm lifting the bar. And remember, Mike and I have very different goals. He's training for strongman, I'm training for powerlifting. But for me, I find that bracing with a belt feels slightly different. Not, not very different, but just slightly different um, for bracing without a belt because you have something to push your abs against, right? So there's that kinesthetic cue. For me, I find it very difficult if I start out uh, beltless and then throw my belt on kind of halfway up at whatever percentage the case may be. I found it a little bit difficult to make that transition. So I've been using a lever belt lately from Pioneer, love it. I start out with the belt unlatched. I'll keep it unlatched, so it's just something to push my abs against. I keep it unlatched until I get about to 60%. 60% I'll latch it. Then I continue to work up. Now, I really like to add things, add supports like that earlier in my workout. I did the same thing with my knee sleeves. You'll see some people only put their knee sleeves on for their heavier sets. Again, I find I'm using knee sleeves for protection. I'm not getting any you know extra poundage out of them, and so I want that on the entire time through my set. It's kind of similar with my belt. Uh, with the exception of deadlift, I don't I don't get much out of the belt. Just a little bit extra support, keeping a good position, and so I find no reason not to use it all the time. So we only have one more question. Kate Fry asked, uh, very quad dominant lifter, trying to switch to flat sole shoes to help balance his posterior chain. Do you have any advice on how he can make that transition smoother? Um, I, I am a big fan. If you are someone who is a quad dominant lifter that's trying to get more posterior chain in on your squat, I am a big fan of box squats. Um, more so, more of the west side style box squat where you are fully deloading and sitting back or deloading your weight. I mean, not just touching and going. You're actually sitting back and, and you know, kind of transferring that knee dominant movement to the hips. Um, I am a big fan of that um, because it's you are doing a squat or a variation of a squat and kind of feeling that sit back and that load on the posterior chain. And you are going to be building some significant strength in the posterior chain as it pertains to coming out of the hole. Um, I would do. I would do quite as much work as, as, a, as a west side lifter who's you know typically going to be a geared lifter because it's a, it is a much different technique and how you're descending but if you're looking to just get a little bit more uh, strength back there and kind of feel how you need to descend to kind of load a little bit more back there especially with the different shoes I'd say box squats uh, but also tempo squats are really good for kind of you know forcing you to, to feel that engagement you know a little bit lighter weight uh, slowing the tempo down uh, things like that, and then you know, just your typical posterior chain work. Good mornings. Uh, there's actually a, a good morning kind of squat variation that um, I picked up from an Olympic lifter friend of mine, where you kind of drop into a squat, raise your ass up, and then good morning it. Um, you know, kind of purposefully doing that um, to, to kind of get the posterior chain involved a little bit more on a squat. Um, those are my recommendations. What do you say? The only thing I would add to that is make sure you make the transition slowly. Don't just switch to flats and then think you're going to do this as much as you could with heels. Make sure you take your time making that transition. Make sure that the only thing you're changing at first is switching to the flat sole shoes. If you try and make more than one switch at a time, you're just kind of founding the issue. You're not going to know whether the flats helped or whether it was the other things that helped. You're not, if it doesn't work, you're not going to know what, what went wrong. So, yeah, just make sure you're patient with that transition. If you're going to switch to the flats, dedicate to the flats at least for a month, if not two months, and just, and just see how it goes. And one quick thing, actually, that I thought of and added that is, um, you know, to, to piggyback on what you were saying, what I was saying earlier is, you know, do sub maximal speed work, um, you know, technique work, position work, tempo work with those flats with a little bit lighter weight to focus on body position and loading the right areas as opposed to saying, hey, you know, I can hit a 600 pound squat in my, in my, you know, um, in my lifters, I'm going to try to go ahead and hit a 600 pound in my flats. Now, you probably want to, you know, knock it down to maybe a 60, 70 percent range, uh, you know, of your one rep in those different shoes so you can really feel the position and move correctly. Uh, something else that can really help you uh, focus on engaging your posterior chain, in particular your glutes on a squat, is getting something like a hip circle or just an Elite FTS mini band and putting it around your knees while you're squatting, um, either in your warm-ups to kind of help engage prior to your, your working sets, or even doing some, some work with that, you know, with a decent load on the bar, with that band around your knees. You know, I even saw Ben doing that the other day with the SSB prior to his top set to really get those glutes firing and really work on engaging those abductors and get everything firing so that the hips and posterior can ch chain can load and do what they need to on your squat. Anything else for today? I mean, it's been a good day. It has been a good day. So thank you all for watching. Again, if you have questions, ask them on the YouTube page, ask them wherever you can. But you know, we're happy to answer whatever, happy to address whatever types of things you all are interested in. So we really, really appreciate feedback. The more you give us, the better. Yeah. Until yep. next time. Yep. Later, guys.